side of Uyuni is Bolivia's probably most well-known tourist attraction, the Uyuni Salt Flats, where the sun gets you from all angles. Ian Devlin's nightmare, skin cancer from both sides. This species of cactus, by the way, grows at about one centimetre a year. So you can kind of guess how old they are. In the middle of the salt lake is an island. And in the island is this arch. And it's a testament to climate change. And I don't mean the man-made climate change we're going through now. I mean the epochal, millennium-long climate change. Because this arch is a mix of volcanic rock, because there's lots of volcanoes around here, and coral because once upon a time, the land was lower and the sea level was higher before the moving of the continents. This used to be a volcanic island with a coral reef. And up here in the middle of the salt lake, they also have a salt hotel. Like Finland has an ice hotel, Bolivia has a salt hotel. And I never thought you could think of salt as a building product before, but that's a salt brick. And that's a salt hotel made out of salt bricks. And as the sun's going down, so is the temperature. And it's suddenly getting quite cold. Uyuni is known for two things, the salt flats and this, the train graveyard. Now these are old locomotives dating back to the 1800s, which were used mainly to cart silver, which was for years Bolivia's greatest export. When other forms of transport took over and the silver price dropped and the volumes dropped, a lot of these trains were suddenly not needed anymore. And they're sitting out here in the desert, slowly rusting. So I'm about five kilometers outside of the center of Sucre, the capital of Bolivia, in a quarry and cement factory. Why would I come to a quarry and a cement factory? Because in 1993, they decided to expand it and got rid of a whole lot of brush off the side of this cliff to discover these dinosaur footprints. This is actually the largest collection of dinosaur footprints in the world. There are at least seven or eight different species of dinosaur footprints that you see here. And some of them remind you how big the dinosaurs are because the footprint is bigger than your head. No, I would not want him to tread on me. Mm -mm. This is a little carnivore. And there are some big footprints here from a large four-legged herbivore. And the big prints are the back legs and the small prints are the front legs. Yeah, it's not as if somehow dinosaurs defied gravity and walked up this cliff. But 60 million years ago, the landscape here was very, very different. This cliff was actually a flat, muddy shore of a lake. And it was only with the movement of the continents that this particular flat lake was pushed up on its side. So these footprints actually represent the dinosaurs walking through the muddy flats next to the lake to go and get a drink. So when I see things like this, I try to imagine what it would have been like here on the day when the big dinosaurs are stomping along the ground and chasing the dinosaur with a spear. The problem with that narrative though, is the dinosaurs were wiped out long before human beings were running around with spears. Now that is genuinely impressive. So welcome to Sucre in Bolivia. Sucre is actually the constitutional capital and I've got to tell you, walking around Sucre is it's a beautiful, peaceful city where the architecture is wonderful and it certainly has the Paz beat. I thought the Paz was kind of boring and the red brick everywhere was a little bit iffy. But Sucre, this is a lovely city. So the authorities in Sucre work very hard at protecting its atmosphere and its architecture which is one of the reasons it's been inscribed on the World Heritage List since 1991, back when you had to be special to get on the World Heritage List. So in the early 1800s, there were two types of independence battles going on in South America. The first one was independence from Spain, from the colonies, and the second one was independence from each other. Now, the independence from Spain battles was led by this guy, 
Simon Bolivar, born in Caracas, which is why the Venezuelan currency is called the Bolivar. But he is revered right through South America and what was then known as Upper Peru became known as Bolivia. So in 1824, Peru got its independence from Spain and what is now known as Bolivia, they decided a year or so later that they were going to get their independence and that's the Declaration of Independence of Bolivia. And it was signed here in this very room. This town changed its name to Sucre, named after this guy, Field Marshal Sucre, who won a lot of the battles for independence. You don't see many paintings of heroic females. Good to see some. Another one. The Tawanaku site is a pre-Columbian site that dates somewhere between 100 BC, 100 AD, about 70 kilometers outside of La Paz in Bolivia. At its height, about seven or 800 AD, it had about 10,000 people, and it totally collapsed by about the year 1000 AD. Tawanaku is the name given to the site today, but the people who actually lived here, we don't know what they called themselves because they had no written records. And a lot of archeological digs are still going on here to try and figure out actually who these people are and what did they do? I am starting to get a little skeptical of World Heritage Sites. Yes, you wanna protect this, yes, you wanna learn about it, but more and more sites are getting added to the World Heritage Protected List and they're getting less and less impressive. The sun port here is the most emblematic feature of the Tawanaku site. It's actually volcanic granite and it came from Peru. And this is Lake Titicaca. One of the highest lakes in the world, if not the highest major lake in the world. It's a huge freshwater lake at about three and a half thousand meters and it crosses the border between Peru and Bolivia. That's Peru over there and this is Bolivia. Lake Titicaca. So welcome to 4,000 metres above sea level to what is arguably the world's highest capital city, La Paz in Bolivia. And I say arguably because is La Paz the capital of Bolivia? Well, it's the centre of government, but the constitutional capital is Sucre. So if you count La Paz as the capital at 4,000 metres, it's the highest capital in the world. If you count Sucre as the capital, then Quito in Ecuador beats it. So this is arguably the highest capital city in the world, but maybe it's not. But because it's so high and so hilly, it's got one of the coolest forms of public transport. Cable cars, teleferiques, little cabins like this one you normally see on the ski slopes. And what we get instead is a bird's eye subway, if you like, zooming across the different suburbs. Landing in Santa Cruz Airport for my last stop in Bolivia, I'm overcome by the amount of smoke that's in the air. So far this fire season, 7 million hectares of forestry and agricultural land have gone up in smoke as wildfires hit Bolivia. So now that I've come off the high plains and down into the valleys, we are surrounded by an enormous amount of smoke from those wildfires. The last thing I'll say about Bolivia before saying goodbye to this country is, there's such a diversity here in many, many ways. One of which is wealth disparity and lifestyle. Here, I could be in any major wealthy city in the world, but if I'm up in Uyuni, I'm in some of the remotest, driest parts of the world. Here, there's plenty of wealth. There, there's plenty of poverty. Bolivia, it's a very interesting country. Think about coming.